the Christian roots of the Jewish faith. Wait a minute. I've always heard this completely the opposite. So welcome to another case for Messiah. Mm -hmm. And we are actually in our third episode looking at the ways in which Yeshua and the New Testament directly influenced yep. rabbinic Judaism. And we started with the, the portion from the prophets re read in the synagogue, the Haftarah, and we saw how that was influenced. So we've seen that, okay, so what we actually read or don't read in the synagogues on Saturdays, directly influenced by yep. the New Testament. The oral law and it's being written down and it's construction and the presentation of Akiva and the Passover. The motivation behind it. The mot directly influenced by Yeshua and the New Testament. Mm -hmm. These and now today we're going to be actually looking at the the ways in which uh, the Aramaic translation of the Torah, right? Yep. And and we said Ankolos was directly influenced by. The New Testament. And we said that this series, we, we're not, it's not our saying, we're basing it on Israeli scholars. And this scholar that, that y y we, we, we see um, now his name, Gidon Statman, again, a religious Jewish scholar. So none of this is something, we're not presenting our ideas. Yep. Right? This is a series that these are Jewish scholars that are looking at the evidence and they're saying, Jesus in the New Testament influenced our faith. Yeah, so Statman is looking on the, on the, at the Onkelos Aramaic translation, and he's starting to see things that, uh, that, uh, that will maybe, uh, maybe shock some of our viewers. Okay, so <laughs> let's just, Onkelos is an Aramaic translation of the Torah. Yep. Just like the Torah had been translated into Greek hundreds of years earlier, uh, right? Yeah, it, but if you go, go go to the next one, and that's exactly what Statman is saying. What okay. is he saying? So because according to Gidon Statman, to understand the goal of Onkolos, or the translation called Onkolos, which is an Aramaic translation mm -hmm. used till this day, we have to actually go back hundreds of years earlier, right, to the time when the Torah was translated from Hebrew into Greek by Jews living in Alexandria. So, so again, I just want people to understand, Statman, an Israeli religious scholar, teacher, says in order to understand the motive and the structure of Onkelos, the Aramaic, let's say, rabbinic translation of the Torah, you have to go hundreds, hundreds of years back to the Greek translation. Now, he's going to make his case, but... Why would you have to go back to the Greek translation to understand the Aramaic translation from the second century AD? So let's see what's 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 the what's okay, how does so, he make his case? So for the sages of the oral law, the Septuagint. This is according to Statman. Mm -hmm. The moment that the, the the Jews translated the Torah into Greek, they actually had to choose a translation. Exactly. Right, they had to determine what the words me meant. Exactly. Okay, and so what he's arguing is that the moment that they determined what specific words and phrases and verses meant, it limited the rabbinic freedom uh, to interpret these passages in accordance with the oral law. Exactly, because every interpretation is also a commentary. Correct. And if you have a literal interpretation and you don't, and it doesn't reflect your traditions, it limited your interpretation. So, so he says again, Stadman, right. himself a religious man, said the the LXX limited by its translation. LXX, by its, the the, the Greek, yeah, the Greek translation limited the freedom that the sages had in interpreting the written Torah and supporting the oral law, their traditions. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And that's what brought. That's why he said. That could be the cause for the rabbis to reject. Wait, wait. The okay. Septuagint. Uh, you're saying that, not me. Yeah. Okay. So, Statman? so Gutman is saying. Statman. Statman is that it was it was rejected. You know that that the, the, the Septuagint was rejected because it didn't support oral law. But exactly. but maybe but maybe going on. Uh, let me just simply. Maybe it was rejected because it was just a bad translation of the Hebrew Bible. Maybe it was just it was just a bad translation of of the Torah. So that could be an argument. Maybe maybe it's not. Maybe the Greek translation is a poor translation, and we should reject it. But that's not 
possible. Why is it not possible? <laughs> Because the Talmud says it's an inspired translation. Yeah, now I want you, this is the origin. According <laughs> That's to amazing. What you're about to read is a quote from the Talmud about the origin of the Greek translation. So read it carefully okay. and slowly. This is really important. This is according to the Talmud. Okay. There was an incident involving King Ptolemy of Egypt who assembled 72 elders from the sages of Israel. From the sages of Israel. The translators are this from the sages of Israel. And put them into 72 separate rooms and did not reveal to them for what purpose he assembled them so that they would not coordinate their responses. He entered and approached each and every one and said to each of them, Write for me a translation of the Torah of Moses, your teacher. And now emphasize what you're about to read. Okay. The Holy One, <laughs> blessed be He. Which is God. Right. Placed wisdom in the heart of each and every one. And they all agreed to one common understanding. In other words, the Talmud acknowledged confesses, admits yeah. that this trans the Greek translation was inspired by God. What's really interesting about this portion from the Talmud is it, it reminds me a lot of the letter to Aristeas, which is, an, it, which is actually an, an ancient letter in Greek that mm -hmm. was written as a way to try to show uh, how much the Jews of Alexandria And how much the Jewish people at the time when, they, when it was translated, how much they, uh, they regarded, high regard for the mm -hmm. translation of the Torah into Greek. This legend that it was translated by 72 different rabbis, that they all had the exact same translation. The point of this legend, right, mm -hmm. is to convince Jewish people around the world that were reading the Greek, hey, this is a really good translation. So obviously the, the Talmud agrees that the Septuagint's a good translation. So the bottom line, we know that the rabbis didn't reject this translation because Yet. it was poor. Yet. No, no, but, but, but they didn't reject it because it wasn't a good translation. Because the Talmud admits it was inspired by God. So why did they reject it? And that's what Stutman wants to find out. If, they, if the rabbis didn't reject this translation because it was bad, why did they reject it? You know, it's also really interesting to kind of bolster the support of the Septuagint as a great translation. So you've got the letter of Steus, mm -hmm. right? You've got, you know, from that's the sec, a, a letter from Second Temple period that was written by Jews. Mm -hmm. You've got the Talmud, right, that... Admits Megillah, that, yep. that also says that, this, that the Septuagint's a great translation, but now you actually have probably the preeminent world-leading scholar of the Septuagint, Professor, Professor Immanuel Tov. Mm -hmm. He's well-regarded, and he argues that the accuracy of the Septuagint far exceeds the Aramaic translation that the rabbis later preferred over the Septuagint. So wait, we have the, the world number one expert says the Septuagint, the LXX is better, is literal, is, is, is a better translation than the Aramaic one. And still, we'll see that the rabbis preferred the Aramaic translation. And so, Statman basically argues here is that if you look at Onkolos, the translation, you can actually see that the way that it's translated, it's not a word-for-word -word translation, it's a paraphrase mm -hmm. And it's a paraphrase that always reads back into the, into the Torah, the rabbinic traditions of the oral law. Now, why is that? Because Onkelos himself was a convert to rabbinic Judaism. His teachers were, were Rabbi, Rabbi Joshua, Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Akiva. So you can expect that his translation was, will reflect the oral law. So it's not a surprise. Yeah. He was a student of the oral law. So Onkelos is not a literal translation of the Hebrew. It's not. Nope. It's not it's a, at all. You can say it's a, it's a, it's a commentary. <laughs> it's, <laughs> like the com living, it's like the living Bible, the <laughs> message, right? Yep. Okay. It is a commentary that reads the rabbinic trans traditions into the Hebrew Bible. And so this Stutman going to give us some examples. And remember, Stutman is saying that's a response to the Greek translation. It's a response, and we, di we, didn't, we didn't say why yet. Be Stutman is building his case, but it's a response. Okay, a response which is to important to see because right now we're looking at the Septuagint. We haven't actually touched how the New Testament is brought into this picture. Exactly. So now Stutman gives a few examples to see how Onkelos embedded or put in 
oral rabbinic traditions in the text of the Torah, in his Aramaic translation. Okay. So there's a few ways so, you can read a few examples. Sure. So Genesis 9, verse 6, whoever sheds the blood of a man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. What does the Ankalos translation say? Which is, it's obviously not word for word. He who spills the blood of a man, through man shall his blood be spilled by witnesses according to the word of the judges? No, that's that's a, not in the Hebrew text. That, that's not a literal, but the rabbis came with the, how do you say in English, the seven Noahites? Uh, the, the, the laws, the seven Noah, uh, laws of Noah. Which are never to be found in, in, in Genesis 9. But the rabbis said Noah, the sons of Noah received seven laws. And one of the laws they received is to put judges and 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 the uh, uh, batei mishpat. How do you say uh, courts? Courts. So Onkelos, knowing the rabbinic tradition, put it in the text. Interesting. So this is not a literal translation. Of course, it's not what the Hebrew says. It's a it's an an interpretation or a reading back of an extra theology into the text. And this is why Professor Immanuel Tov says the, the LXX, the, the Greek translation, uh -huh. is much more literal and accurate because it doesn't add traditions that are not in the text. It's trying to understand the Hebrew text. Exactly. Okay. Let's see another example. Okay, so Genesis 12, 5. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. Okay? So the uh, souls they've gotten the in souls Haran. That, what is that? Okay. What does that mean? Yep. Probably it means they're servants, right? Yep. Okay. But here's Ankalos' translation. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all the possessions which they possessed, and the souls whom they had made subject to the law in Haran. I.e. converts to Judaism. Converts by, by the law, by Oraita, the Torah. So through the Torah, Abraham, and there's a Midrash that Abraham and Sarah used to convert Gentiles into so-called rabbinic Judaism, even in Genesis. But this is long before Mount Sinai. This was long before, before the, the Torah, Torah was given. But Onkelos, knowing that rabbinic tradition, put it in the text. Amazing. And by the way, these all examples are from Gideon Stutman. Okay. We, okay. Did, we didn't come up with this. He, he puts these examples and he keeps the best for last. But okay. Well, we've we're got, going. We're getting there, right? Getting so there. Genesis 25 verse 27, Jacob was a plain man, right? Dwelling in tents. Tents. Now, what is a tent? Okay. Let's see. So here's Ankalas' translation. Yaakov was a wholesome man living in tents, serving in the house of... Study. Learning what what does that refer to? In the yeshiva, in the, Greek, in, in the Aramaic, it says ulpana. Ulpana is what we know today as the yeshiva, the place you study the oral law. In other words, Jacob was a rabbi, a wise disciple, studying in the yeshiva, the oral law. Even though the, God didn't give Israel the commandments until Mount Sinai. And it just says, it's a contrast between Isa, Esav, and Jacob. Where was Isa? In the tent? Esau was a he was hunter. in the field, yeah. A hunter. And Jacob was sitting in the tent. So the rabbi is saying, of course, if he was sitting in the tent, what he could he do? He was studying the oral law in the yeshiva. Interesting. Okay, Exodus 23, verse 19. That's a good one. That's a big one. Okay. As you harvest your crops, bring the very best of the, f uh, of the first harvest to the house of the Lord your God. Mm -hmm. You must not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. A young goat in his mother's milk. It, okay. it, it repeats itself three times in the Torah. Young goat, mother's milk. Okay. What did Onkala say? So Onkala says, the beginning of the first fruits of your land must be brought to the house of the sanctuary of the Lord your God. Mm -hmm. You must not cook a young animal in the milk of its mother, that is, eat meat with milk. Lo tochlun basar bechalav. In the Aramaic, it literally says, the Aramaic, not to mix meat and dairy. Not to eat. Not to eat. Not to eat meat, meat with and dairy. Milk. With milk. Uh, this, again, where, where, do you, where, where do you see meat in the Torah? It doesn't say meat. It says a, a, a young goat, not every meat. So this becomes basically, uh, he's reading back the whole tradition of the Jewish diet. Exactly. A later tradition. The rabbinic Jewish diet. Into, yeah. into this passage. It, it, it says cook and a young goat. And Onkelos is saying eat and meat. Just general meat. You can eat meat with milk. Interesting. Yep. Leviticus 19.34. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself for you were foreigners in Egypt. 
So this is that's the you know, that's no, what the text says. This is really says. important. Be, before you, I, I want you to make it clear to our viewers that the word foreigners in Hebrew appears here three times, and ger. it's always, always the same root ger, ger. ger. three times foreigner, uh, foreigner native and foreigner, three times the same word and, in Hebrew. In biblical Hebrew, it just means foreigner, foreigners. Ger, and As anybody can be a ger. We we the Israelites were, we're foreigners in Egypt. Right, I see. But ger comes to mean. Somebody who converts to Judaism. That's what Onkelos does. Okay, so as, so Onkelos, as one of your native born settled ones, he shall be considered by you the proselyte who lives with you, that is, converts among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you were foreign residents, strangers in the land of Egypt. You see what Onkelos did? Even though in Hebrew it's the same root word, sometimes he says proselyte, a convert, and They're sometimes talking about a the Gentiles. Exactly. If it's a Gentile, it must be a convert. In other words, Jews can't be ger. They can't be gerim. They can't. They, they understand the word ger here to specifically mean a convert. Somebody who converts to Judaism, and, and therefore it can't be referring to Israel. So he changes the word. And Onkelos himself is a convert to rabbinic Judaism. So you see, he now, now he gives himself the the proof text for his conversion because it's in the Torah. And Bible scholars are saying, conversion is never to be found to be found in the Torah. Not only in the Torah, in the entire Hebrew Bible, every woman like Joseph's wife, uh, Osnat, yeah, like Tzipora. Uh, so Osnat sounds. I got to tell you, it's funny. That's a funny name for for English speakers. So Asanat. 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 Yes. Yep. Uh, the, the the wife of Moses, Tzipora. So Tzipora. Rahab. Uh huh. And Ruth. Bible scholars are saying they only joined Israel by faith and by marriage, never by conversion. So conversion is a later practice. Is a but later practice. Ankolas reads it back into exactly. the pages of the Torah in order to support later rabbinic Judaism. Exactly, and we said that Statman um, wants to keep the best example for 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 the for the final. For for last. Okay, so not only did Ankalas respond to the Septuagint, according to, to Stutman, it seems that its translation, right, yep. was actually a response directly to the New Testament. Exactly. So wait a minute. Hold on. This is a bold statement. What, what, what Stutman is making now, not only that, that, that Ankalas is putting his own, his own the, the rabbinic tradition that he learned into the, the biblical text, now he's saying, Statman, that there's an example of Onkelos reacting to the New Testament itself. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's, Let's see. Okay. So here, uh, why? Now, why? why, why, Onkelos, why, why how, Statman, how can you say that? Why do you say that? And what, what, and again, okay. Statman builds his case slowly. Okay. What does he say? So he says the New Testament was written in Greek. And when its authors quoted the Tanakh, they normally used the Septuagint. This caused the rabbis to move away from the Septuagint in favor of a new translation oh. that reflects their tradition. So now the cat is out of the bag, you say in English? Okay. Now Stutman is saying... Explain this, explain says, this. This is really a, important. Stutman is saying, what, but the rabbis are noticing that the, 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 the followers of Yeshua, the Jewish disciples of Yeshua, are using the Greek translation... F uh, 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 when they quote from the Bible. They wrote the New Testament and when they quote, they use the Greek translation. So the rabbis, the rabbis can't use it anymore. It's, it's, it, 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 it became Christian. The Greek okay. translation became so, Christian. <laughs> so here's, here's let, me try to, let me try to wrap my arms around this. Again, this is so, Statman, not so us. So <laughs> what ends up happening is that the early followers of Yeshua, the Jewish disciples, the Jewish disciples, there's there there a lot of them were speaking in Greek and they were ministering to people that spoke Greek, okay? And so they're taking the Torah, which had been translated into Greek, and then other scriptures, old uh, Hebrew Bible scriptures that had been translated mm -hmm. into Greek. They're taking these passages, which the rabbis themselves claims to be inspired by God, okay? And they're using the 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 Greek translation to prove that Yeshua is the Messiah and the translation that they have in their hands is very compatible with identifying Yeshua as the Messiah. And the rabbis notice it. So in, in the eyes of the rabbis, 
the, the, the Septuagint, the LXX, became a, a, a Christian translation. So what are they going to do? They need their own translation. Exactly. A translation that proves the oral law, because in their mind, the Greek translation proves the New Testament. We need a new translation that would prove our traditions. Golan, this is mind-boggling. So the, the Septuagint proves the New Testament. Exactly. And again, the Talmud says that the Septuagint was inspired by, was God. Inspired by God. And so what the rabbis did? They basically, they have a translation that the supports exactly. the so, tradition. So here's the last example that Stutman brings. Okay. And so here's what's really interesting. So Deuteronomy 21, verse 23, okay? His body, this is just the Hebrew, you know, the translation of the Hebrew. Mm -hmm. His body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged is accursed of God. Yeah, now hang, talui. talui. Talui in Hebrew is just hanged. Hanged. Hang on the tree. You hang with a rope. Hang. Just hang on the tree. Okay. Talui. Yeah. So what does Uncle so say? So what did Uncle All say? Right. Now read it slowly because this is, again, amazing. Do not leave his corpse overnight on the cross. On, on the, the cross. On the crucifix. In, in, in Aramaic it says on the cross. It's, it's clear. It's yep. tzliba, the yep. cross. But you are surely to bury him on that day. For a hanging corpse is an affront to God, for he was crucified because he sinned before Hashem, before the Lord. So do not defile your land that the Lord your God is giving you as a territory. Wait a minute. So what's what, happening here? It seems like Uncle Os knows that there are Messianic Jews who, who goes in Israel and say that Yeshua was crucified for the sins of the nation. And Uncle Os is saying... No, 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 no. He was crucified for his sins. Now, does that remind you of a prophecy from the Old Testament where the Jews will look and say, we thought he was crucified, we, we thought he was crucified, he was killed for his sins. Yeah, that's Not Isaiah 53. Exactly. Which seems to be an, a, a confirmation of, of Isaiah 53. And what did we show in earlier episode about, about Isaiah 53 in the Haftarah? Did, do we read about it in, in the synagogue? We don't read about it, right? Because it was removed from the, from the Haftarah. And Uncle Os is saying, he was crucified because he uh, sinned. Because, and this, is, this, this, this translation of Uncle Os is quite obviously referring to, you, to yes, Jesus. It's why quite he, obviously. Why would he two times put the word cross? He doesn't have to. Two times he put the word cross and he emphasized... He was crucified because he sinned. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. And of course, we know where he took it from, right? This really, the way that Ankalas writes the, his translation, it, it looks as though it's a direct response to Jesus, to Yeshua, and also to Paul's understanding of this verse as a reference to the fact that Yeshua took our sins. Exactly. And what right? did Paul write in Galatians? Gal Galatians 3.13, the Messiah redeemed us from the curse of the law the curses of disobedience, mm -hmm. right? By becoming a curse for us, for it, is, for it is written, a curse on everyone who is hung on a tree. Exactly. And, and by the way, put, you see, Paul is using hang on the tree. Hang, literal meaning, really literal translation of the Hebrew. Onkelos says, crucified on the tree. So he's, Onkelos is quite clearly responding to Paul in exactly. Galatians and chapter three. Let's see how Stadman concludes his... So, uh, so Statman concludes by saying that the Onkelos translation became the way of implementing, of encouraging, of aiding the implementation of the oral law into the Jewish life. But not only that. The Septuagint, although it is endorsed in the Talmud as being inspired by God, it was rejected by the sages because it was used in the New Testament to prove that Yeshua exactly. is the Messiah. So... The Onkelos translation is intended. It's the, it's the replacement of the Septuagint. And if the Septuagint was used as proof for the New Testament, then Onkelos became proof for rabbinic Judaism. Exactly. They have, those Christians have their text, their translation, we'll have our translation. And by the way, Rashi was dependent heavily on Onkelos, and many of Rashi's commentary was made 
as, as and you can say as an apologetic or to protect his community from so-called Christian interpretation of the Bible. And Rashi himself used onkelos. Which is interesting because he relied on a paraphrase, even though Rashi tends to be understood as, as, as the looking literal. at the literal meaning, but obviously he he was not. He was literal like onkelos. Yeah, it's really interesting. <laughs> Yep. So let's let's conclude. So we said that Yeshua and the New Testament. You know, we talked about the the, the Christian roots of the Jewish faith, yep. and so three things: Yeshua and the New Testament influenced what is and what is not read from the prophets in the synagogues, even today, into this day. Yep. Yeshua and the New Testament directly influenced the production of the writing down the the, the shape incentive, of the, the incentive for. The creation of the oral law, mm-hmm. right? And, and finally, and then finally, Yeshua and the New Testament directly influenced the translation of the Torah into Aramaic. So much so that Statman says it's a reaction. The Aramaic translation is a reaction to the Greek translation used by the New Testament authors. Amazing. Let's land summarize. Let's land the plane here, Golan. So number one, um, Professor Hanan el article shows that the New Testament actually reflects a much more comprehensive reading, a much more open reading to the prophets, which the later sages preferred to ignore, particularly yep. because the more of the prophets you read, the more it looks like Yeshua. Especially the passages used in the New Testament. Correct. Yep. It also appears that the New Testament is not a later development that was birthed from rabbinic Judaism. Israeli scholars are saying that rabbinic Judaism and many of the rabbinic traditions were actually birthed and a response to the New Testament, to Messianic Judaism. Exactly. Onkelos, which is revered today is not really a translation of the Torah. And that's, again, not us saying, this is Gideon Stutman. It's a paraphrase designed uh, to prove the oral law. The proof text of the oral law. Right. And finally, we could say, if we've looked at this series, you know, we can say that Yeshua's influence on the Jewish people is just as profoundly felt as his influence on the rest of the world. Yeah, and maybe we're waiting for the day that his influence on the Jewish people would be more acknowledged, right? Amen. So Amen. we talk about uh, Joseph, right? And, you know, the story of Joseph is so, so uh, appropriate here. And, and, and Joseph, you know, God called Joseph. He gave him a task to rule over his brothers. The brothers didn't want him. They rejected him. Even hated him. Hated him. He was sold into slavery. The brothers were standing in front of Joseph one day. Couldn't he didn't recognize him. He looked like a Gentile. He talked like a Gentile, right? He, he, they didn't recognize him. But the beautiful grand reveal, when, when Joseph was alone with his brothers and he, he, he took off the Egyptian clothing and in, in a beautiful Hebrew accent, right? He said, I'm Joseph. Your brother. I, I'm Joseph, your brother. And there was a beautiful... Uh, reunion and hugging and tears. And that's the day that we wait for. And what we've seen in this series is that, you know, and you and I can say this as Jewish people, it's hard to run away from Yeshua because he's with us. Amen. And one day as a people, we're going to recognize him. Amen. Amen.